，林安柔医师。林安柔医师有在线上吗？欸、他他有在，可是、欸、他的声音好像听不太到。哦。哦。喂，叫我声音吗？哎、欸，有了。老师有听到吗？那你是不是要先录？好，这样有声音吗？老师，有有声音。哦、oh, ，那我开始喽。好，请分享画面。这样有看到吗？有。Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm a third-year resident, Lin An Rou. And today, I'm going to present this paper, which is just published、uh, on the Journal of Stomatology, Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery in this month. And it is titled "Correlation Between Alveolar Cleft Volume and Alveolar Bone Quality." In patients with unilateral cleft lip and palate, a combined CT study, which is、uh, by an Iran dentist and orthodontist group. So the cleft lip and palate is the most common congenital facial anomalies, and three fourths of the clefts are unilateral and occur more commonly on the left side. And it is also associated with many problems regarding、uh, nutritional, hearing, speech. Respiratory, dental, facial development, aesthetic, and also psychosocial problems. It also、uh, has an increased prevalence of dental caries, a genesis of the maxillary lateral incisors, supernumerary teeth, microdontia of the maxillary lateral incisors, enamel, hypoplasia, bleeding, unprobing, and plaque accumulation, etc. Also, patients with the cleft lip and palate are reported to have a higher prevalence of dehiscence and fenestration in the anterior region of the maxilla. Here, the fenestration means that a circular-shaped bone defect, in which the roots are denuded of bone, only covered by gingival tissue without involving the marginal bone. When the defect extends to the marginal bone, it refers to dehiscence. And the estimation of the cleft volume is very important for surgeon before the alveolar bone grafting. Combin CT is currently regarded as the most reliable radiographic method to assess the bone defect. So the aim of this study is to measure the alveolar cleft volume and assess its correlation with the presence of fenestration and dehiscence in the alveolar bone in unilateral cleft lip and palate patients using Combin CT. And this is、uh, this study is a descriptive, descriptive and cross-sectional study. They evaluated 68 non-syndromic complete unilateral cleft lip. Uh, and poly patients, they all had conventional lip repair between three to six months old, and cleft poly closure between eight to eighteen months old. And combined CT was、uh, was performed in each patients before the alveolar bone grafting, which also prior to the eruption of their permanent canine tooth. And the inclusion criteria include complete unilateral cleft lip and palate, standard lip repair at three to six month old, cleft palate closure at eight to eighteen month old without infant orthopedics procedures, Iranian ethnicity, and the extraction of the DICOM file from volumetric combined CT data, and the available patient's gender and ages data. And the exclusion criteria. Were syndromic complete lip, 
cleft lip and palate, alveolar bone grafting history, permanent canning tooth erupted at the cleft site, and corrupted CT, uh, combing CT images, or there were noise and scattering or artifact in the combing CT. And also the clap, uh, collapsed maxillary arch requiring expansion prior to the bone graft, absence of the tooth adjacent to a cleft were all excluded. And the patients were selected using the convenient sampling and all the combing CT scan were trans um, transferred to the DICOM format and then transferred into the system called Research Mimics Innovation Suit 3D Analysis Software. And first, the segmentation model was selected and the line was drawn passing through the alveolar bone next to the cleft in the actual plan. And then it would create a gray value graph along this line. Next, the start thresh, uh, holding feature was selected and a binary image would create based on maximum and minimum threshold values. As a picture shown, you can manually select the maximum and minimum values from the thresholding graph so that the borders of the defined mask will match the bony region. And this image are known as masks. It includes all skeletal tissues without vasculature, muscles, nerves, skin, or adipose tissues. And the software is not able to calculate the cleft volume directly, so the authors need to <coughs> outline the clefts by themselves. From the sagittal plan, the inferior surface was identified by selecting the cemental enamel junction of the adjacent uh, in central incisor. And the buccal and palatal borders were determined using the buccal and palatal contours of the contralateral site. And the mesial and distal margins of the defect were determined by the borders of the adjacent alveolar bone. And the superior border would be defined on the sagittal image where the initiation of the nasal cavity is. And then a 3D object of the mask would be created by the software. Under the sagittal plan, the dehiscence and penetration can be defined. In this study, they considered more than two millimeter distance between the cemental enamel junction and the alveolar bone margin in three consecutive slides as dehiscence. Same rules, uh, penetration should be observed in three consecutive slides indicate, uh, and it will indicate the presence of penetration. So coming to the results, there were a total of 32 boys and 36 girls. 83.8% were left side. And the mean age was 10.93 uh, years old. The mean slide mean slice thickness was uh, 0 0.23 millimeters. And the mean cleft volume was 628.66 cubic millimeters. And the, pres uh, the, pre the prevalence of the dehiscence was 79.4% and the penetration was 17.6%. The main cleft volume was correlated with the presence of both dehiscence and penetration in the adjacent tooth. And also, the author did the logistic regression to assess the effect of the cleft volume, age, and gender on dehiscence and penetration. And it shows that only the cleft volume had a significant effect on the prevalence of dehiscence or penetration. The Spearman's correlation coefficient was applied and showed that the cleft volume had a negative correlation with fenestration and a positive correlation with dehiscence. In other words, the smaller clefts were correlated with a higher number of uh, fenestration defects, while larger clefts were associated with a higher number of dehiscence defects. In addition, there were 48.5% of the dehiscence uh, which located in the buccal surface and 77.4% in the palatal surface. 23.5% of the dehiscence was, uh, occurred in buccal and palatal surface.
And there are some significant differences regarding to the cleft volume and the dehiscence lo location. Also, uh, six patients had penetration in the buccal surface and another six in the palatal surface. It shows a significant difference regard to the cleft volume and the penetration location as well. So um, estimation of the cleft volume by surgeon based on their experience often results in inadequate or excessive bone harvesting from the iliac press or mandible synthesis and associated with many complications. Combined CT is suitable to determine the cleft volume and the prevalence of dehiscence and penetration as well. In the previous study, uh, the prevalence of dehiscence and penetration ranged from 34.1% to 79.9% and 0 to 13.3% respectively in the cleft lip and palate patients. A previous study recorded 21 bilateral cleft lip and palate patients with a mean age of 14.02 years old. And they reported a 61.11% dehiscence in maxillary anterior teeth and 48.41% in the mandibular anterior teeth. However, it has a higher prevalence in their study, and it can be due to the fact that uh, the other study involved the bilateral cleft lip and palate patients. And another study by Buyuk recorded 44 unilateral cleft lip and palate patient with a mean age of 14.04 years old. And they also conclude that higher prevalence of the dehiscence and penetration could occur around the maxillary anterior teeth. Regards to the cleft volume, the MIMIC software was used here because it has the least error in segmentation measurement and with the accuracy of 0.01 millimeters. However, the author pointed out several studies before also used the same software to calculate the cleft volume while showing a different results. A study by Surahan evaluated 22 unilateral and bilateral cleft lip and poly patients, and they had a result of 2,040 cubic millimeters of cleft volume. The volume is actually, uh, the value is actually double, but it also may be due to the fact that they also included bilateral cleft lip and poly patients there. Another study by Chen recorded 10 unilateral cleft lip and um, Palate patients, and it has a result of 1,811 uh, cubic millimeters of cleft volume. However, the different value may also be due to the different CT tool they use. They use the helical CT instead of the combing CT. And another study by Kinklick also recorded uh, the unilateral cleft lip and palate patients. And they conclude that their, the cleft volume of the children was uh, 963.51 millimeters. And, all, and in other sense, it was 1,001 cubic millimeters. But it's a relative small sample size study, and also the CT slice thickness was 0 0.5 millimeters, which is thicker than the current study. And another study by Linderup evaluated 32 patients and had the result of uh, 934 cubic millimeters. However, the different superior border was used in that study. And there were some limitations mentioned by the author, which include the patients were operated in the different medical centers and also the lack of uh, clinical assessment of periodontium. And from this study, the author concludes that the preoperative mean value of the alveolar cleft was 628.66 cubic millimeters. And the cleft volume had a negative correlation with the prevalence of fenestration and a positive correlation with the prevalence of dehiscence, which is very important in the orthodontic treatment planning of the patient with unilateral cleft lip and palate. Um, thank you very much. Um, thank you, Dr. Lin. Uh, after reading this uh, journal, uh, do you have some 
uh, comparison between the this study and uh, in our center, because uh, it seems to me that the uh, incidence of the uh, dehiscence and some complications uh, it seems to a little bit too high to comparing to our center. Uh, sorry, because I have minimal experience in the cleft lip and palate. Okay, okay. And uh, I need some comment from from our colleagues, uh, uh, Dr. Zhang Frank. Uh, could you give us some some comments about uh, this uh, study? <clears throat> uh, yes, uh, Professor. Uh, uh, the previous study by uh, Dr. Zhou and. Uh, Myself, our average the violent deficiency is around one point, uh, one thousand two hundred uh, millimeter millimeter cubic, and uh, uh, meanwhile our study is focus on focus on the violent on the on the violent after the surgery, uh, we do not uh, focus on dehiscence. Second, uh, Dr. Liao uh, performed a study. Uh, they, they do not show the uh, penetration. They show the root coverage uh, ratio. Uh, how many uh, percent the root is covered by bone? So uh, it's different, uh, different uh, parameter that uh, we studied. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And uh, Professor Law, Professor Law, could uh, do you uh, hear some? Because uh, like, uh, in our uh, in our, would like yes, to please. ask Dr. Go to uh, to comment because I think he is uh, he has done uh, several uh, related study. Dr. Zhou? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Uh, according to our previous study, uh, to survey the how is the how much is the volume from our patient of the clap, um, there are some uh, result just like the professor Frank Chen saying around the one point five oh no one thousand five hundred cubic millimeter uh, uh, the 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 volume for a patient with the unilateral uh, clap. And around the two point uh, two thousand and five hundred uh, cubic millimeter for the bilateral cases. Uh, however, in our previous study, we are not talking about uh, dehiscence and uh, fenestration uh, for as our complication or as any outcome to survey all our clap patient. Uh, however, as for the professor Clement Ling's asking, uh, should we have any complication in our uh, the center. Uh, actually, there is no a very high incidence of the oral nasal fistula following the first time of alveolar clap or uh, very obvious the, the dehiscence the rate for our patients. So I think um, probably because of we have several patients receiving the nasal alveolar morning before the alveolar clapping. So the minimal or the already reduced the, the age between the clap distances. So probably we have a, a higher uh, successful rate for our patients. Yeah, that is my comment. Uh, Professor Liao, uh, can, can you give us some uh, comments uh, from your perspective? Because from the orthodontic doctor's view, uh, usually you see the the outcomes of our uh, ABG uh, surgery. Now you see. Now you see, you have in the Hey, 
Okay, yeah, yes. Um, I show them separate the demonstration and the he says these two things we we often evaluate the uh, the things that uh, of nasal leakage and uh, fistula and and the periodontal status of the cleft adjacent teeth uh, so usually i uh, in clinically, I observe these um, these uh, these items uh, instead of uh, observing um, the the dehiscence rate in combing CT. Yeah, that's just my personal experience. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, um, uh, is there any further question or comment? Uh, then, then we may proceed to uh, the second topic. The second topic will be by uh, Dr. Wang. This topic will be about uh, one case, uh, a rare case about the uh, the uh, cranial facial uh, petrosis. Dr. Wang, please. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm fourth year resident Stephen Wang. And today I would like to discuss, the, uh, I will present the complicated case report presentation in the, in the journal. And uh, I will try to find some uh, reference to discuss uh, with the uh, osteopetrosis and the OJ surgery. Sorry. So first uh, I have searched for uh, uh, because, because definitely want to uh, discuss this two of topic. And so I'm searching for the osteopetrosis and uh, related to the OGS surgery papers, but there is uh, theoretically there, there's no, no matched paper. We have found it. So from, uh, I, will, uh, I will place some reference to discuss of this case report <coughs> to make a further discussion. So this, uh, this paper is published uh, this year and uh, for journal uh, Engel Orthodontist and the impact factor is 1.5449 uh, and the uh, author is from Korea. So first, uh, uh, I uh, still have to discussion about, uh, uh, introduce about osteopetrosis and it is a rare bone disease where it's marked increase in the bone density. And there was a uh, main three uh, classification, uh, infantile, intermediate, and uh, adult onset, three type of this, this kind of disease. And the uh, mechanism is uh, osteoclast dysfunction because there was a poorly or non-functional osteoclast that they will decrease the bone resorption and the remodeling and it will form a sclerotic bone <coughs> uh, in, in the patient. And the prevalence is about uh, uh, one to uh, uh, 100,000 to five, 500,000 <coughs> in the different references. And there was some associated uh, presentation like uh, decreased uh, cellularity and the vascularity of the bone. And uh, they may cause the nerve compression or systemic bone pain or anemia or thrombocytopenia. And for the diagnosis, I have uh, mentioned about it, it was three types of classification. The first one the, is uh, autosomal recessive infantile, malignant osteopetrosis. It will happen, we can diagnose it in the early infant. And the uh, autosomal recessive intermediate type, the glucose uh, mobile bone disease, is, uh, we can diagnose it in the childhood. We have found it. There were some uh, neurological complications and uh, dental abnormalities. And the uh, autosomal dominant adult uh, osteopetrosis is uh, we have uh, diagnosis later in life and this is the uh, prognosis the best prognosis one then there were uh, less severe symptoms and the best survival 
And about the uh, dental facial deformities like uh, teeth allergens, <coughs> uh, genesis and uh, delay eruption, and some of uh, like malformation or even osteomyelitis in the child will be happening in this kind of patient. So for the osteoporosis, there is not only three type of this classification. There was a lot of inheritance type of the, in this kind of patient, uh, this kind of disease, like uh, autosomal recessive and autosomal dominant or even S-link. It was just, just a different mutation, the problem in the cascade of activation in the osteoclast. For the complications of uh, osteoporosis, very uh, uh, a, a variety of a lot of uh, different aspects that we have found in a different uh, different field. We also have a complication for in this uh, this uh, case we have discussed. Uh, they will have a delayed failure of teeth uh, eruption and the malformed crowns, roots, and the uh, scoliosis and the conductive hearing loss that we have found in these uh, complicated cases. And for osteopetrosis, there were some uh, radiological findings, like uh, you have uh, at the right side, you can see, uh, le left side, you can see the picture, the uh, acral osteolysis in the distal phalanx of some, and uh, <coughs> there was a loss of angle of a mandible. And also there was a sandwich, a sandwich image because there was <coughs> a higher uh, uh, sclerosis image in the, <coughs> in the spine. And also, also an increased bone density was found in the femur. So for this uh, journal case presentation, it's a, a 19 year old woman with uh, chief complaint is about a severe male occlusion and an anterior mite. And clinical presentation is in, is very relatively complicated. You have uh, unrepaired bilateral avalu clipped and the maxillary left uh, <laughs> central incisor should at ectopic eruption in the pre-maxilla and the impairing hearing. And the surgical history is uh, there was, uh, he have, she has been performed a primary repair for the bilateral cliff palate and uh, cliff lip and palate before one year of age. And the posterior fixation for the cervical lumbar scoliosis will be, uh, will, uh, was performed in the 13 year old. So this is the intraoral examination. You, as you can see, uh, uh, like the picture, there was a loss of a multiple th teeth and a severe crowning and uh, transverse uh, maxillary collapse and uh, some dental caries in the multiple remaining teeth. And for this is a 3D uh, uh, dental, dental cast. Uh, we have seen there was a poor alignment of the teeth and the male occlusion was noted. For the cephalometric analysis, there was uh, <clears throat> uh, there was uh, class three skeletal malocclusion and with the maxillary retrusion with the mind uh, mandible prognosis. <clears throat> and for a CD scan, if you can see the there was increased bone density density in the several uh, places of the CT, like uh, bony sclerosis in the medullary portion were noted and the discontinuity of the alveolar segment. Uh, the bone density test and the laboratory data which shows uh, the bone density was within the normal range and the laboratory data showed that there was a normal bone turnover rate in this patient. So in some real case, the diagnosis is of somewhat dominant adult uh, benign type 1 the osteopetrosis. So uh, we would like to correct the dental facial uh, male occlusion and open bite. So, the first one, the treatment object, and the first one is so uh, we will correct, improve the skeletal pattern and soft tissue, soft tissue profile and achieve the normal overject overbite and uh, uh, <coughs> to relieve the crowning of teeth and achieve the ideal occlusion. So there were the authors have offered the uh, initial three options for this kind of patient. The first one is a surgical, um, pre-surgical orthodontic treatment with the bimaxillary, also <clears throat> OGS surgery and bilateral alve alveolar cliff repair. And here is designed uh, <clears throat> like uh, bilateral bimaxillary OGS with the genioplasty and the alveolar cliff repair was used uh, three piece left one osteotomy. Then you can enable this 
Uh, this option can enable the maxillary ad advancement to improve the maxillary hypoplasia. And the potential complication is the postoperative osteomyelitis. And uh, by later, we have to, uh, I will discuss uh, this, this, uh, this aspect later. And the uh, second, <coughs> second option is the bilateral alveolic lift repair with the iliac bone graft and the uh, <coughs> camouflage uh, orthodontic treatment. And this, <coughs> because, uh, however, it, it has a severe collapse of the maxillary arch, so there will be uh, unpredictable prognosis and the occlusion correction maybe is that possible. And, but uh, the potential problem is there was no correct, uh, correcting in the skeletal deformity and the, of course, uh, of post-operative osteomyelitis. And, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and, and third option is just use the orthodontic treatment with the post for orthodontic uh, treatment. There is a most uh, ther therapeutic the limitations because but it can minimize the potential complication associated with the osteopetrosis like osteomyelitis and so on. And so the final decision, but because the, uh, the patient is relatively very complicated, so the first, we would like to uh, achieve the, best, the most best outcome. So we, <coughs> uh, we choose the, the, the author, choose the final uh, option one for the final decision. So the treatment process is uh, because there was no history of a pathological fracture or uh, failure of healing after teeth tooth extraction, and there was a normal bone turnover rate. And so the pre-surgical pre orthodontic treatment was performed and the teeth with hopeless prognosis was extracted and the leveling and alignment of teeth for decompression is doing a uh, correction for two years. And this is the orthodontic the treatment the picture. As you can see, the alignment and level has improved than the pre-orthodontic uh, treatment. <clears throat> and the second part is about the surgical treatment. We use the bimaxillary OGS uh, with the uh, alveolar cliff repair with the illegal ADA bone grafting. They use, they use the three piece level one osteotomy design and the expansion of a maxillary width and the impaction. Maxillary advancement, genioplasty. Then the intermaxillary fixation was performed, <coughs> was kept at two days after, uh, was doing at uh, two days after surgery and maintains for about 10 days. And this is the picture, as you can see, the maxillary advancement and uh, the manifold setback. The red line is the post operation, the black line is the pre operation. The genioplasty is advancement about eight millimeters and reduction for five millimeters. So this is the <clears throat> after surgery, then the post uh, orthodontic treatment, the cephalograms uh, track uh, tracings and the paramedic <clears throat> that showed above, as you can see, the, uh, <clears throat> the position and alignment uh, have been improved. And also you can see in a dental case that the occlusion has been has improved. So the post-treatment clinical result, there was uh, normal bone recovery and there is no osteomyelitis and no complication related to the osteopetrosis. The total duration of the treatment is about 45 months, including the prosthetic phase. So let's now uh, we would like to discuss it. Uh, first, uh, just introduce about the treatment of the osteopetrosis because there was uh, several medications like the large dose of vitamin D, cassitriol, with the restriction of the calcium intake, this it can uh, stimulate the osteoclast to, to stimulate the bone resorption and the gamma interferon to it can decrease the uh, trabecular bone volume to increase the bone value. Uh, bone marrow balloon and also corticosteroid, you can st uh, stimulate the bone resorption and hormone therapy. And uh, for the malignant uh, osteopetrosis, the bone marrow transplant is uh, a golden standard. So this is the main we want to know. Should we perform the surgical orthodontic, treat surgical orthodontic treatment in this kind of osteopetrosis uh, patient? There was, uh, based on the literature review, I think there was uh, three of considerations. The first one is uh, we could treat by the orthodontic therapy alone or not. The second one is the risk of osteomyelitis. The uh, third one is the goal of treatment. Okay, so should we perform this? Is there was uh, 
uh, uh, most of them, because this is a rare disease, so most of them is uh, case report. Then there was a study from uh, 2011. There, let's suggest there were for the dental facial deformities and malocclusions, we were just uh, doing the supportive therapy and there was no active uh, treatment because they were, they were very difficult to deal with the osteomyelitis. It could be recurrent and it, it's hard to treat. And there, were, however, there was uh, there was another study that about at uh, 2013. There was a, uh, the patient. This kind of patient can do the uh, male occlusion correction uh, treat after the bone marrow transplant. And uh, osteoporosis is not a contraindication for the uh, uh, surgical intervention. Okay. So another part is. Uh, so, so the doing the surgery in the conclusion is remain controversial, and the risk of osteoporosis related to osteomyelitis. Osteomyelitis is a well documented uh, issue in the osteoporosis patient because uh, the mechanism related to the reduce of a uh, bone vascularity and the impairment of the PBC function and increased infection rate. There was all, uh, over thirteen case report uh, talk about this, and uh, most of them is associated with the teeth extraction and the surgical intervention. And the most uh, osteomyelitis is happened in the manipul. So this is uh, for, if we want to do a surgical intervention, and this is, uh, this, uh, the osteomyelitis is the one issue that we should be concerned. So how many, uh, how, uh, how many risk, what's the risk of, uh, if we perform OGS in the, uh, in the normal patient. Is there a high infection risk or not? So I have found two papers. The first one is uh, analysis of complication. The patient under uh, agnostic surgery <coughs> is 30 years a resurfective study with 58 patient with uh, level one BCSO and genioplasty. The most complication is a TMJ and uh, pathesia and uh, super infection. I just concluded, I just played this uh, as this table show. Uh, there was a two kind. Of, uh, the author has divided into two kind of uh, infections. That the uh, more severe, that you have to remove the plate and screw. It, another is less severe, that you don't have to remove that. The most uh, is over 30, uh, 20 percent in this sub study. But compared to our uh, craniofacial center, I think our infection rate is not not really that high as as my experience. And for this is uh, another uh, studies uh, have published in a scientific report. And uh, there was only the surgical to discuss with the surgical side infection at the OGS. And uh, so the patient diagnosis with surgical, <coughs> uh, surgical side infection is only 8%. And uh, there was only 5% who have uh, extensive, uh, extensive uh, cellulitis. And uh, only 2% for <coughs> Uh, there was only two patients have the osteomyelitis. So uh, for this, after review this uh, literature and reference, I think the uh, <coughs> OGS surgery is not, uh, have uh, osteomyelitis is not a high risk in the OGS surgery. So for the, after this review, uh, this literature and this case presentation, I think the osteoporosis is not an absolute contraindication for a surgical orthodontic treatment. And the treatment of the bone marrow transplantation and the endocrine evaluation should be done before the surgical intervention because if you have the uh, bone, normal bone turnover rate or your uh, osteoporosis has regression, that will <coughs> uh, significantly lower your uh, risk of osteomyelitis. And uh, also, so the third one is the risk of osteomyelitis in osteoporosis is high. So surgical related inf infection should be avoided very carefully. Uh, even, if, even if the infection rate of the OGS is, is not really remarkable. So that's uh, my presentation. Thanks for everyone. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wang. Uh, because in clinically, we, we probably uh, see some patient with osteomyelitis, but uh, is there any chance of uh, osteonecrosis after this uh, uh, infection or inflammatory process for uh, those patients? Uh, because the, the osteopetrosis 
uh, is a relatively rare condition for patient going for also next surgery. And uh, for those patients, their uh, blood supply to the bone may be much less than the normal patient. So uh, could you give us some uh, comments or uh, you, after your, your search, after your uh, study? Uh, for the osteonecrosis, uh, I have found about uh, two, uh, two to three papers to have a discussion about the uh, osteonecrosis because uh, based on the mechanics of which uh, the Professor Lee have mentioned about the decreased vascularity and, the, and of course the post-infection, post-osteomyelitis, osteonecrosis will happen. So that's why the, there were several, uh, several studies that have uh, talking about the, not to perform the surgical intervention because it's really hard to deal because if you are, have less uh, vascularity, then your bone healing will be a problem. Then you can control, also can control the infection. Then finally it will cause the osteonecrosis. So it should be a concern when we perform this kind of surgery. But for my personally, I, I haven't uh, faced the list. I, I don't have any experience for this kind of patients. So maybe there were further uh, research or uh, case series have been performed in the late future researches. Thank you. And uh, in this, in this uh, case study, the, uh, the, the surgeon planned uh, uh, three, three pieces of uh, the full one osteotomy, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, usually in our impression, the segmental osteotomy also, also can be related to some osteonecrosis if the uh, soft tissue protection or connection was compromised. Um, so uh, I, I, I don't know uh, how, did they, did they mention about the uh, surgical, uh, uh, the, the points that we have to pay attention to during the surgery? to uh, emphasize on the safety for this surgery in this paper. Uh, Did so, they mention uh, that? I think this is the part of the weakness of this uh, paper because uh, they only just mentioned about the options and the surgical planning about the, uh, yeah. the cases. And uh, for, the, uh, for the concerning about the osteonecrosis, uh, most of the osteomyelitis and necrosis will happen in the mandible of the uh, osteopetrosis patient. So I think maybe there is why they are trying to, they are very uh, uh, brave to, <laughs> to doing the three pieces, the OGS for the maxillary part. And also because he had the uh, bimaxillary cliff plate palate. So, so they were uh, trying to do the better outcome to by using the uh, three pieces design, but there was no such things to mention in this uh, studies. Yes, yes. And uh, Dr. Zhou, Dr. Zhou, Zhou Bayun. Yes. We, we know that you, you had uh, some experience in this type of surgery. Could you give us some comments? Actually, I, I have no experience in dealing with this kind of a patient, but um, Professor Ray Chen has some experience uh, in treating uh, such kind of patient. Uh, the recently, uh, one case is uh, the osteopetrosis um, uh, majority that happened in the, over the, the manipul and the patient want to come uh, to receive the contouring and the, his whole family was diagnosed is like a family tree with the osteopetrosis. So we have reviewed this kind of uh, literature review, just like the uh, Sihan reviewed the very, very uh, detailed uh, literature presenting this kind of cases. Um, um, uh, in the future, uh, in this kind of uh, osteopetrosis, we are going to connect into uh, our 
another professor, Xiao Ganan Ke, Chiu Zhenxun Yi Si. Because we are going to survey about the gene of the osteoporosis in such kind of patient and what kind of surgical intervention we can deliver for those the demand. Yes. So, so actually I have very minimal experience to dealing with this kind of patient. Probably we can ask him, Professor Yuri Chen. Uh, Professor Chen. Yes, uh, actually I do not have any case of uh, cat patients with uh, uh, osteopetrosis, but do we just that would so say that we did have uh, a family that had the uh, also, dom uh, also some dominant family tree, and many patients have this kind of deformity, but they do not have cleft. The second is that the surgery is uh, very conservative in some way. Uh, this family have a tendency of class three malocclusion, but we do not uh, dare to do the OTS because number one, this uh, osteotic Dr. Wang he is very conservative about uh, this kind of work as well. So still functioning well. So what we did before is only the bone contouring, removal of the protruded mandible and uh, try to remove bone in the nasal cavity so that can breathe better. And cosmetically and functionally, the breathe better. But for the occlusion to do OGS, we do not have this kind of experience yet. Uh, but anyway, uh, this is very rare disease, and uh, it seems to be that technically bone is very hard and like marble. So it's, I used to use a burr, burr out, but uh, Dr. Yao, Ao Chenpong, had used the saw and cut it. It's a little bit difficult, but still we can do a very good job. Well, Dr. Zhou is uh, trying to review in a series of uh, papers. And if possible that we can present it in our forum uh, in this uh, patient, in about two patients in receive surgery. And uh, the third one is coming, uh, the girl one. I hope that you can do that in the uh, winter time. Thank you. Hello, do you get me? Uh, yeah, yes. Yes. Okay, but uh, Professor so, uh, Clement Ming is- Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. yeah. Oh, yeah. sorry, yeah. I, I did not open my microphone. <laughs> so, so thank you. Thank you, Professor Chen. And uh, uh, is there any uh, further questions or comments? Um, the, the osteopetrosis is a quite rare condition. And maybe we can uh, further uh, search our, our, our cases and then uh, we can have some uh, further treatment for them. Uh, if no uh, question or comment, then, then we uh, close our meeting this morning. Thank you, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.